let's get going. Um, I hope that text is big enough for you to read. Um, please shout out in the chat or uh, otherwise if it is at all difficult to see. Um, otherwise, yeah, so here we are now on day two of the course. Uh, you can see we're starting on debugging on Archer 2, then moving on to profiling on Archer 2. Then we've got a little more uh, general material on how to um, be a good user of Archer 2 uh, and using the safe in the afternoon. Before this afternoon, we have a um, sort of consultancy session, I suppose you might call it. Um, you can come to us, um, to, to James and me, if you have any questions about anything, if there's any software that you're trying to use or trying to get compiled and maybe you want to ask anything about that, maybe if there are any difficulties or just more general questions about the things we've been talking about. Otherwise, we have um, a sort of general have a go at profiling task you can try out. But yeah, just for now, uh, let's get going with the debugging session on Archer 2. So here we're expecting, we'll see if it actually works out, to spend about 30 minutes going over material and about 30 minutes doing exercises. Because in this session, you'll actually get to do a little bit of debugging yourselves. <clears throat> so, um, so as says, so Archer2 has a, uh, actually several different pieces of debugging software available. Um, we're going to briefly go over those, but we're actually going to demonstrate um, and allow you to have a go at debugging a small MPI program using a piece of software called GDB for HPC. You've possibly used GDB yourselves before. It's a fairly widespread command line debugging tool. Uh, this is an, um, an enhanced version, I'll call it, uh, hence the 4HPC um, provided by HP Cray on the, uh, on the HP Cray EX systems like Archer 2. Um, cru crucially, uh, the 4HPC here is indicating that this is a version of GDB which has been enhanced to, um, to, to make the debugging of parallel programs much easier. It is possible to do it with GDB, but you, um, you have to set things up yourself um, and it's not necessarily very easy. I think GDB for HPC is actually a pretty nice tool to do this. Um, and of course, Here's a link that will take you through to the Archer 2 documentation on debugging where we go into all of this in more detail. So to briefly go over the tools that are available on Archer 2, so I've already mentioned GDB for HPC and this is what we'll be using now. Uh, we'll be looking at it uh, in particular in, in this uh, usage mode where we start GDB for HPC and then within it launch parallel programs and then debug them. But you can also use it uh, to attach to, uh, to an already running job. So perhaps you've got a parallel job running and you suspect it's having issues, maybe it looks like it's frozen. You can start GDB for HPC up and attach to it and then start poking around trying to find out what's happening, what's gone wrong, how do you fix it? And that's loaded via the GDB for HPC module. We've also got Valgrind for HPC. Um, again, Valgrind is a very widespread um, tool in terms of its use. You've possibly, again, used that yourself for uh, the debugging of memory. Um, again, this is an enhanced version provided by HP Cray um, to work for uh, in the context of parallel programs. Um, the main way thing it does is, is it aggregates across processes uh, and all, again works uh, much more simply with parallel job launches and that's also available via module. <coughs> uh, Cray stat is available um, to get merge stack traces if you're trying to see where the, the points where uh, uh, programs have crashed maybe and you want to look through the stack traces and if you've got to you know, imagine thousands of 
tasks and you've got a stacked face for each. You don't really want to have to look at them individually. This uh, is much better merging across them and also provides visualization tools. Um, and that ties into ATP. ATP is a, um, a very simple tool when it works. Um, that gives you, again, backtrace analysis for when they crash. It's fairly simple to initialize. You just load the module at runtime and set an environment variable, and then you should get a nice stack trace even when your program crashes. And you can then feed the output from that into stat to visualize. Um, CCDB is the uh, Cray Comparative Debugger. This is a, a GUI tool. Again, you can bring up two versions of your code side by side, run them, see where, where the differences occur during their execution to really let you look, uh, look around and see what's happening while they're running, again, via, uh, available via module. And um, the next line, so this is actually not quite correct. So ARM DVT is um, I think actually a really nice tool. Uh, it says it will be available soon for Archer 2 users. That isn't correct. It's actually available now for Archer 2 users. Uh, there should be documentation on using it on the Archer 2 documentation website. And I believe we've got a couple of, um, uh, of hour long uh, webinars on the Archer 2 website. Um, which I can point you to if you're interested, um, showing you some general usage. Ah, oh, fantastic. James is just linking that in the chat. Thanks, James. Yes, yeah, so if you're at all interested in this, um, I, I think ARM DDT um, is a really powerful tool. It's a GUI based tool. So uh, the general use mode is that you start, a, um, it is that you, um, uh, you start a local client on your own machine. Which, is again via the GUI and then set that up to connect to Archer 2 uh, through SSH, fairly simple to set up. And then you launch jobs from within the GUI. Uh, it brings up your code and you've then got a full uh, GUI based debugger that lets you set you know, breakpoints, uh, it lets you um, explore the variables that are currently. Uh, in the memory and their values. It's, it's a very powerful tool. If you're at all interested, I can recommend looking into this. Uh, thanks, and James has just linked the video on that as well. Fantastic. Um, okay, but for today, we're going to go through um, what I'll call probably the, the default choice for, for debugging, uh, which is, uh, as I say, GDB for HPC. Um, so I've got uh, Firefox open on the left with the material that um, you, you can hopefully uh, get up yourself if you want to, to have, have a read through. And on the right, I've got my terminal window, which I'll just expand a little and I'll make that, I'll make the text a little bigger as well so you can follow along. And um, we've got some sections to just walk through together. And then as we go through this, there are just a few sections for you yourselves um, to have a go. You can, you can run these, uh, these examples um, and use the tool to see if you can work out where the issues in the code are. And by the end of this, so we can start off with a, with a buggy piece of code that doesn't run and we'll end up with a fixed piece of code that does run. So, we're going to uh, grab this piece of code here. You can just uh, use wget to grab it from the course web pages and copy it onto Archer 2. So if you're all able to log in, um, you'll be wanting to copy this into your work directories because we'll be running this as a job. And that means we have to run from the work file system. Remember, uh, you probably saw yes, uh, sorry, on Friday with Julian, um, but everything to be run as a job on Archer 2 has to be run from and within the work file system because the home file system is not mounted. So here I am on the right in my terminal. Um, if you'd like that uh, text bigger, uh, again, please say so in the chat. Um, 
But I'm logged in, you can see there's my username at login node 03. And here's my uh, path into my own work directory within the TA081 project. So um, I'm just going to create a directory and I'll just call it debugging. Um, something nice and simple, I guess. And uh, within that, I'm just going to now copy this wget command to grab the piece of code. And there it is. So I should now have it. Yes. Um, OK, so you can, of course, open that code. You can take a look at it. So I'm just going to open it quickly with Vim. You can see there is our code. It's a fairly simple piece of C code using MPI. Uh, of course, you can open that with um, Nano or, or Emacs, whatever you prefer. And we're going to build that code um, using the uh, Cray compilers in this case. Um, so if I just do an ML to show you, I've uh, got everything here uh, just as it is when logging in, nothing special. Um, so if I just do CC, that's just going to use the regular Cray C compiler. I'm going to use the G flag. Uh, which adds debugging um, symbols into the finished executable so that when it's running, the debugger can pick things out and see where it is in the code. Um, and I'm just going to call the uh, executable GDB exercise. Let's look exactly what I've done on the left in the course material. And if I run that, that will build, and I've now got my original source code and the executable GDB exercise. So as mentioned at the top, we want to use GDB for HPC. We need to load that module. So it's actually the command module load GDB for HPC. And if I do ML, uh, we can now see that module has been loaded. So we've now got um, everything in place to start debugging essentially. So we can start GDB for HPC. We'll start it up and here we go. Uh, and we're now in a prompt debug all and an arrow. And well, to just start things off very simply, we can use this command here to start executing it. So to quickly explain what we're looking at. The launch command um, is fairly self-explanatory. Launch will start a new debugging job. Um, it, if you don't already have um, a reservation, uh, I shouldn't say a reservation, if you don't already have a job in place to use uh, interactively, and I'll talk a bit about that at the end of this session, then what's going to happen is this is going to create a new job and start executing your program within that job. So launch here is going to start a new debugging job for us. Then we've got this uh, long launcher args option. So the same launcher arguments, so the arguments which are going in this case into, into Slurm, into S1. And here we essentially give all of the options that we would give, uh, say, to sbatch uh, if we were launching a job script, or to srun or salloc if we were starting an interactive job. So we want to do things like tell, uh, tell Slurm which, uh, which account, which budget to charge the job to, which partition to run on, standard, uh, which QoS, so we'll just use the short QoS, which means we also need to run uh, to 20 minutes maximum or less. So here we'll choose 10 minutes. Um, remember the default number of nodes is one. So we're just, just going to leave that out and go with the default number of nodes. One task per node, one thread per, uh, one CPU per task. Ask for exclusive, which we don't really need to do, but we're doing it here anyway, 
And finally, we're doing this uh, export equals all, which means take all of our current environment variables and uh, include them in the job. Then we finally got these two uh, bits at the end. Um, the last bit, dot slash GDB exercise, probably makes sense to you. This is us saying, what executable do we actually want to run within the job? What, what, what executable are we going to be de debugging? Um, so that makes sense. This bit is a little more unusual, perhaps. Uh, dollar my prog one. This is uh, where we give our executable, our job, um, a reference within GDB for HPC. Here, what we're doing is we're saying we're, when we uh, when we refer to, or if, if we need to refer to a specific job within GDB for HPC, we will we're going to refer to this one with the name my prog. And here, within the curly braces, we're saying it's going to have a single task. So we kind of have to duplicate here. Uh, the number of tasks. We have to tell GDP for HPC within launcher args here how many tasks we're going to be uh, running the job across. And then we also have to tell it here again. We're, we're going to say, and we're going to refer to this whole thing as my prog, which has one task. So if I copy all of this in now and then run it, that will hopefully, doing this live always comes with some risk, of course, and um, I think that looks like it's starting up okay. This should start a 10 minute long job. So if, it, if, we, uh, if we take more than 10 minutes doing this, it will exit because that's the, um, the uh, most time we've allowed for it within Slurm. We do get a couple of warnings here. We can, actually, yeah, as we can actually safely ignore these. Um, and then some messages. So, uh, so, so the way that GDB for HPC actually works is it does actually start servers running uh, GDB on each of the um, for, for each of the tasks, and then connects them all together. So we get some messages about that happening. And then finally, we get launch complete. Um, and then uh, we get this message here, my prog zero initial breakpoint main. This is telling us now that uh, the job which we're referring to as my prog has started. Uh, it's one task member we're launching one task only so that's going to be referred to as task or process zero here uh, has reached its initial breakpoint so it started running and then gdb for hpc has paused it and it's paused it within the main function and it tells you where exactly in this uh this source file through, with the whole path here through to GDB for HPC underscore exercise dot C, and that's at line nine. So there's our debugging job started. Um, we've reached our initial breakpoint, so it's paused. It's waiting for us to do something, whether to investigate the code or to start uh, executing the program again whether to just let it run until it hits something or whether we want to step through it more carefully. Um, and at this point, we get a, a whole plethora of options we might choose to use to start investigating the code. Um, some of the more commonly used ones are listed here in the, uh, in the course material on the left. So you can see um, the very first one I've listed is help, so I can just run that here and you'll see it will list everything. And you can then um, do things like um, give, you know, help and then the name of one of these functions for some more information. Um, so we might come back to this, um, and this is, I think, handy if you just want to quickly check out the sort of things that you can do. Just for now, we're going to look at just a few of these, uh, a few of these commands. We're going to look at list, next, print, and watch. So 
we know that our code has um, started executing and it's paused at what was it line line nine within gdb for hpc exercise.c and that's within the main function so let's take a look at what we can do if we run list. So list is going to show us the code that's about to execute at our current breakpoint. So it's going to tell us here my prog zero. So this is telling telling us that uh, that task zero of the my prog job is at line nine within that file. And that's so what's about to happen is it's about to run MPI in it. Then there's a blank line. Then it, it even shows us the comments in the source code. And then it essentially shows us the next 10 lines of source that are about to happen on uh, the rank zero task of my prog. We can run that again and again, and it will show us more and more lines of that file of source code, of C source code. What you can also do is you can actually uh, abbreviate these commands. So rather than run list, you can just type L, so just the first character of list, and press enter. And that will show you again the next 10 lines. So we can see that after the MPI send, there will then be an MPI barrier. And we can check all the way through that file if we want by just running list or its abbreviated form L again and again. So that's what the source code looks like. This is what will happen, but we're still up here. We're, we're still paused. Our execution is still paused. That's line nine of this file of uh, in, inside the main function. So we, we're, we're still just about to execute MPI in it. We can carry on running if we do uh, next. So next, we'll move on to the next line of source um, within this file, within this function, rather, is really the way to put it. So if we type next and press enter, then so you saw there was a brief, uh, a brief delay there. When I pressed, when I, when I typed next and pressed enter, it went to the prompt for half a second, and then this output appeared. Uh, so this output is telling us that my prog task zero, our single task again, um, has moved on a little bit further and we're now at line 13. And if you do list again, so I'll just type list in full, it's now going to show us what line 13 is. So we've moved on to the next line, which is MPI com rank. So here we're getting the rank of our task. Um, yeah, and um, something else you can do, if you know that you want to skip ahead a certain number of lines, you can do next n. So you could do, you know, say next uh, five, say, and that would move you through the next five lines before then pausing again. What we're going to do though, we're going to actually look here. So we're going to look a little at what's actually going on in this code. So we can see um, after the MPI com rank, something's going to start happening. Um, we're going to set a variable called count, which is equal to rank plus one. We're then going to start doing different things depending on what the rank of this task is. Is it rank zero? Then we're going to do this. If it's rank one, we're going to do something else. And then we're going to start doing some MPI communications. And we can see that count is being used here. So let's just um, ask ourselves, say here, just out of interest, what's going on with count? So we can do print, we'll do print count. So what is count? we actually get the result back. And again, this is telling us that the rank zero task of my prog has a value for count of just over 2 million. If, uh, and as and we'll see later on, as you bring in more tasks, this will show you 
uh, the different values of counts on the different tasks. So in that case, it will be ag aggregating the values across different processes. Um, and what we'll do later on also is we'll use the watch command, which will keep a track of counts and alert us when it's changing to its new value. So we're going to go now uh, into one of the little mini practical sessions, one of the little exercises. So hopefully you've been able to follow along doing this yourselves on Archer 2. So we're going to ask you now, what happens if you keep on using next and list? If you haven't started yet, you can get going very quickly. All you've got to do really is uh, copy the source code file, build it, load GDB for HPC, start GDB for HPC, then you use the launch command. You can copy and paste this directly across into your terminal to start the execution of the job. And then just next list, next list. Step your way through. So I'm just going to ask you now to have a go at that um, and try that out. See what happens if you keep on doing that. This is a pretty simple one. So I think, um, so it's uh, 10.39 now. So let's give it five minutes. We'll come back at 10.44 um, and see what you've all found from trying that out. OK, um, I hope you've been able to experiment just a little bit there in GDB for HPC. Um, has anyone who's had to go at that found out what happens when you do this, when you just keep on moving through the program with Next and List? It breaks when you try and send the uh, messages to another rank. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> exactly. If you take a look at the code, so if I just open um, the code here, oops, if I can type it correctly. Yeah, it's pretty explicitly, um, the, the code is built around having two ranks, isn't it? Um, it's going to, it looks like it's trying to send something from rank zero to rank one, except of course, we just started it with a single rank and so when we get to this point and uh, this MPI send is trying to send to rank one well uh, it isn't very happy and we just get an MPI error and crash out. Okay so that's um, oh, I guess I just open this here yeah um, yes yeah, so we get to line 18 and then crash out with an MPI error. Um, <clears throat> so if we uh, were to quit GDB for HPC, um, the reason for that is that you can't use my prog again. So if you, you can you can kill my my prog if you like, uh, kill that job within GDB for HPC, but you won't be able to use that uh, name again for it. And often it's easier to just exit and then start again. So if you quit out of it. And start up once more. Well, we're going to uh, fix that fairly simple problem at least uh, by launching uh, this time with uh, two tasks per node rather than just one. We'll get the same messages as before. Uh, so you can see here I've um, tasks per node is set to two and I've just the same given two in the curly braces for my prog so that GDB for HPC knows it has to uh, work across two different processes. And we can see this uh, it reflected here as well. Once it's got the job running and started the execution of GDB exercise, we've now got a message here telling us that my prog uh, and processes going from rank zero up to rank one, that is both of our processes have reached our initial breakpoint, which is at the same place. I can just do list again, uh, <clears throat> which is line nine 
within the main function. So back again, just about to do MPI in it. Um, okay, so this time we should at least uh, deal with that issue where we were not running with the number of tasks that we should have been running at. Let's try a watching count. So we can uh, do watch count here. And now we're doing something uh, a little different. We've got it set up so that what's going to happen now is that um, it's going to let us know when count, this variable count, changes. So that's what we're doing for the next exercise, and we'll take um, we'll take ten minutes for this. So we'll come back to this at ten fifty-seven. We will be working a little. We'll, we'll 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 be working ten minutes later than the schedule as given on the website, but we did start ten minutes later anyway. So I don't think that's too bad. Um, we can maybe make up that time in one of the later sessions. So yeah, so we'll take ten minutes for this. Um, so what we're going to try and do for this exercise is if you just start it up again, do the same thing I've done here, watch the count variable, then move through the code. Watch what the two different tasks do. We've already said, um, I mentioned a minute ago, that um, um, task zero would be doing one thing, Task one, we'll be doing something else. Okay. Can you see what happens when we reach this point? Can, and can you see the problem? You can possibly see the problem at the moment. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to observe it's happening in action with, with GDB for HPC. So, um, yeah, so let's come back to that at 10, uh, 1047 and we'll see if you've managed to observe the problem and maybe also seen how to fix it. Okay, uh, that's been 10 minutes on that. Um, so, uh, from those of you who've been trying this, have you found the problem? I will... Uh, quickly get GDB for HPC running again. Okay. Okay, well I'll show you I'll show you all uh, what happens when we try this. Um, so I'm going to use that same command there. So I'm launching the executable across two tasks, uh, which will just take a second. And then I'm going to watch the count variable. And then we're just going to start moving through the program again. So if I watch uh, count, and I can do this at any point, I can print count and see what happens. So print Count shows me that at the very beginning it's still got this under here. Um, I can, as always, list, and then I can next my way through it. List again, next. Okay, so it's still telling me both tasks are now at line 15. If I next once more, I hit a watch point, one variable expression count. Okay, so what's happened to count? It's telling me that something's happened there. And indeed, something has happened there. They uh, originally both had that number just over 2.1 million. Now we've got a different number on each of the two tasks. Uh, the rank zero task has given it a value of one. The rank one task has given it a value of two. That's exactly what we would expect. Int count equals rank plus one. Okay, great then we can see there's some communications that's going to be happening with them. Uh, so let's just try going next again. Um, also, we were previously uh, on line 17 just before. 
So this is telling us both tasks were on line 17. That's the uh, if rank equals zero line. So we're now um, diverging what we're doing depending on which rank each of the tasks is. And when we do next, we can indeed see that they've split. So this is now telling us that the rank zero task is on line 18. The rank one task is on line 21. We do list. It now gives us output for each of those tasks. So on line 18, we're about to do an MPI send uh, to, uh, to the rank one task. So from, from zero to one, and that's giving it a uh, tag of zero. And the rank one task is receiving from one with a tag of one. You've probably already seen the issue there. Um, if I do next again, get something a little different. OK, so rank zero is now uh, on line 19. That's this MPI barrier. So if you remember, when you get a when you hit MPI barrier, everything within that communicate uh, everything within the communicator, which here is MPI com world, so everything is going to wait until everything else has hit the bar barrier as well. So here it's going to wait until the other task also reaches the barrier. Okay, but uh, there's no output for rank one. If I list. I actually get at something here. The application is running. So, so the rank one task has gone into the uh, the MPI receive, and it's running that, but it hasn't yet e exited. It's 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 still running. It hasn't hit the next line. Remember, when when we when we run uh, next or n. The code is going to execute until it hits the next slide within the current function or subroutine, if you're in Fortran, and then it's going to pause again. That hasn't happened for rank one. Rank, rank one started executing the, uh, the, um, the MPI receive, and it's still running the MPI receive. Um, there are actually some things we can do. So, so, so this is the problem that's happened here. Um, so the, the issue is that um, that the rank one task, this MPI receive, wants to receive from, from task one, which doesn't make sense. We're task one, and it was task zero, which sent the message. So it's trying to, it's trying to receive a message from itself rather than the rank zero task, which actually sent the message. And also, the tag on the message doesn't match the tag on the message which was sent. So the MPI send, that was fine. It sent the message, then returned, and now it's waiting at the barrier. So the rank zero task is happy. It's it sent its message, and it's waiting. The rank one task is not happy because it started its MPI receive, and the message it's trying to receive will never arrive because it was never sent. Um, can we do a backtrace? Yes. Yeah, so, so you, if you try, so you can do BT, which is backtrace, and you'll get something. So you'll get a stack trace for like, uh, for the two different tasks. Um, you can also do halt here. So, you, so if you do halt, so this will deal with the application is running for task one. So we're now pausing everything. We can do a backtrace. And now we'll see what's actually happening in the uh, rank one task. And we can see it's in main at line 21. Well, that's that MPI receive, the, the, the bugged MPI receive. And then it's actually, you know, we can see the uh, the the uh, stack that's going through from that's called through PMPI receive MPI R wait, all the way down to the uh, quite low low level functions that are being called to do the communication. So the issue there is pretty obvious. So uh, we can quit the code now.
and so it creates GDB for each PC. To fix that, um, so let's, I'm just going to open it in Vim, GDB for HPC. And the issue, as we said, um, is the tag. So, um, so I don't know, I'm just going to change the tags to be one. So the message being sent now has a tag of one, which is the same as the tag on the message being received. And I'll also fix it so that, um, so that the message being received is coming from rank, the rank zero task rather than one. So we're now sending a message with tag one um, to, uh, from rank zero to rank one. Rank one is receiving uh, a message from rank zero with tag one. It should now work. I've done that correctly. Um, so there's one last part of the code uh, which we need to do because this still won't quite uh, run. Uh, so let's let's build the code once more. So cc g same as before. Start GDB for HPC. Um, I'll run this command again to start it. Again with two tasks. Um, the issue is with counts. So process zero now is going to try to get the sum of all the even numbers between zero and twenty. We're again going to see some divergence. Uh, process one is going to hang just the same, but it will reach the MPI finalized part. And it can't move beyond that uh, until process zero does the same thing, also reaches MPI finalized. So, um, so let's just, I'm just going to watch count again. So again, every time it changes. So let's just uh, next, moving on. So I'm just going to run this again. Um, so I don't know, where could we move on to? We could move on to say, uh, I'm getting the message that count has changed again. So if I print count, I see it's changed. If I list, let's move on to say uh, line 25. Um, so I'll move on, let's say, let's say next, um, what is that next? Next, uh, Eight, I think we'll do it. Zero is in, is running. Uh, so now I might have just done things wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure. What's happened here? Face. Want to know what's happened? So that's at line nineteen. What was line nineteen? I suspect I've taken a step sideways. Rank zero barrier. Did it hit the watch point for count when it was inside the MPI call? It may have done. Because uh, that's got me before, because then the, the debugging symbols aren't listed in the MPI oh, implementation and you kind of get lost. Yeah, I think you could be right there. I'm going to skip that this time. <laughs> so 
So, starting once more. <laughs> this is always the uh, the risk of doing it live. Um, let's just uh, next a bunch of times. Next, next, again and again. We've diverged. Now sending uh, and receiving. And we're now um, on the barrier on both lines. Now line 20 and 27. 27 and 34. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what's happened. So now what's happened is um, the rank zero process is now going into its little uh, its little extra section here where it's calculating the even numbers between zero and 20. And uh, rank one, the rank one task has hit MPI finalizes and is now going to hang around there um, until everything finalizes. So now we're going to use steps. So 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 next moves you to the next line within the function. Step takes you into anything which you call. So if we were to keep on doing next, we would see it's sort of uh, the, the, the information that we get would be that it's waiting here at line 28 in main. We're going to use steps. So now what we'll see is that the rank zero task is moving into some even. Um, so if we do the list, we'll see that uh, MyPog1 is now in the middle of doing MPI finalize. Uh, and rank zero is uh, now at line 43, which is inside some even. Can keep on doing step here. List again. We're now at line 45. So it's now doing this loop um, in, where it's going through and we're trying to, uh, to calculate the sum of these even numbers. Um, I'm bearing in mind now that it's uh, now 12 past 11. Um, I'm just going to work through this and you can just watch this happening uh, rather than us doing this as an exercise. Uh, so I keep on stepping through. So we, we'll, we'll just keep on seeing that the rank one task is still running in the background um, because it's just, it's just going to wait there in MPI finalize until rank zero does the same thing. Um, but if we step, we'll see we're now at line 46 in rank zero. We're inside this, this loop. Um, we can step now at line 47, 48, 45, 46. Okay, so something's happening. Um, we can uh, print. Um, we can print what's going on here if we wanted. We could print result. We could print uh, I. Take a look at what's going on. So let's just try, I don't know, let's just try printing I. That's not printing. Okay, watch, watch. Maybe we could print results. See well. Checking these variables, uh, my rustiness here is showing a little. But what we can see is that we're clearly going in a loop here, which we would expect, uh, except as we step, or indeed next, 
can just use next as well where it's inside that function so we can just keep on using next just to move through it um, <clears throat> and we won't have a get out of it um, so if we check the solution here the problem is um, we're setting um, the, the way that this loop is working we're never going to move inside this if statement to increment i. The issue is this 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 i plus plus is never going to happen because this is never going to be the case. This uh, this uh, this if is never going to be, be true and bring us inside. So i is never going to increment when we're never going to add to result. So if we if we just step through this or next through it, we'll see that we loop and loop forever. We never actually are able to escape from this. So finally, what we need to do, uh, if I just quit from this, what we need to do is just move that I++ outside the loop. So if I just do gdb for hpc exercise.c, it's uh, a matter of deleting the I++ there and uh, putting it in there like so. And that finally should be, oops, I'll keep saving, that should be the program fixed. Okay, so um, I'll just try to move through the next section uh, so we can then catch up a little to schedule. Um, so that's the sort of very basics of how to run, um, how to how to start a debugging job from inside GDB for HPC, uh, and to examine what's going on inside it, to step through it, to see where the different tasks are going and what they're doing. Um, I've found in the past that sometimes um, it, it, this, this really depends on how congested the system is. Um, if you need to stop and start running these, these jobs very quickly, maybe you, you know, are quickly changing things, it can be, you, you, can, you can spend a lot of time just waiting for the jobs to begin if the system's in a period I use usage. So, so what, what, what can be better to do instead is to, um, is to start an interactive job uh, using SSALOC, um, just request the, uh, the number of nodes, the resources that, that, that you want to use. So in this example here, we're just grabbing, um, we're using the standard partition standard QoS, um, and we're asking for two nodes with 128 tasks on each. And that would grab you those resources for a maximum time of whatever you specify in the time margin. So this is just a, a, a normal way of starting an interactive job on Archer 2. Um, if you were just running nor um, if you're just running normally, you would follow this up by S running your executable. And that would then go and run on the nodes that have been given to you by SALOC. Um, but what you can do instead when you're debugging is you can then just module load GDB for HPC, run GDB for HPC, and then once it's started, you can just do launch, myprog, whatever, GDB exercise. And that will immediately go and start running on the nodes of on, on the uh, on the resources which were given to you when you ran s s alloc so your job is actually starting up here so you you start your job here and then you just are uh, are just starting the execution of the executable through gdb for hpc here so before when we, we were running this when we were running you know launch launch arcs this is this is launching a whole new job and that comes you know, with all of the overhead on top of that. If the system's very busy, you'll be waiting for that job to start. 
So if you need to stop and start this many times, you'll potentially be having to wait a lot of times for the job to start. So if you think you'll be in that situation, something which might be a lot more, um, a lot snappier for you, a lot, um, a lot easier to work with is to just start the job as an interactive job and then to just do the launch of the executable within that job. It also saves you having to do all the launch logs because this, this has already been taken care of by the, by the S, S alloc. So you just S alloc once um, to, uh, to get your nodes reserved for you and then start GDB for HPC and you can stop and start as much as you like running GDB for HPC jobs on those nodes. The only thing uh, where you will still see some overhead is in the setting up of this uh, of this network of the debug servers. Um, so we've only used one or two tasks here. So we were doing, um, remember, um, well, up to show you, we were only ever doing uh, two here. If you were um, doing, you know, 256, you would be waiting a bit longer because now it's starting 256 debug servers, getting those to talk to each other. And as you increase that, 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 that number, the uh, launch does get a little slower, but it's still going to be faster potentially than having to wait with every new one of these commands for a whole new job to spin up for you. Um, yeah, so that may well be more, more convenient for you if you are doing uh, debugging work um, where you're having to stop and start a lot. Um, the other mode of using GDB for HPC is to attach to a job which is already running. The use case here is that you've got something going maybe and you take a look at it, take a look at the output and it seems to have stalled somehow. You don't know how, but it's still running according to Slurm, um, but it's just not doing anything. So it's locked up somehow. What you can do then is you can attach GDB for HPC to it while it's still in that state and then have a look at it to hopefully find out what's going wrong. So you do that by first getting the job ID using S SQ, um, then you would use S stat to find the job step running the code. Job step is just um, slurm speak for which S run within the job script is the one that we're interested in. So you can, you can write a job script with multiple S runs within it. Um, and they would be, you know, point zero would be the first one, point one would be the second one, point two would be the third, and so on. So um, most most jobs though have a single S run within them. So you will run S stat on the job ID and get job ID dot zero. So that's your your specific job step that you want to connect to. So then you can just uh, start up GDB from HPC, same as before, and run attach. Then you've got to give it um, some identifier again, my prog. You can skip the curly braces there, because that's already been determined by Slurm here, and then give it the job step to attach to. So one, two, three, four, five, point zero, for example. And then you can do all the regular GDB for HPC commands to start investigating. And then once you're done, you just release my prog to let it go again. Um, yeah, so we cover all this in the Arch2 documentation. HP Cray also provides some. Um, we've got uh, the other tools, as I mentioned, these are covered um, in the documentation. Arm again, I would recommend if you if you really do want to sort of do some power debugging, um, I would recommend looking into our DDT. Um, James has linked um, some of the documentation and a webinar we had on using that um, in the chat there. 
um, or you can just find them if you just head to the Archer 2 website and look at the webinar recordings and such. Um, so yeah, I would recommend looking into that if you're at all interested, it's a great tool. Um, otherwise, of course, you can always get in touch with the service desk to help. Um, so with that session finished, we've now got a morning break. I'm, I'm not keen on cutting these short, so it's, it's 25 minutes past 11 now. So, um, so let's just come back from that break in 15 minutes time at, uh, at 20 to 12, and then we will start to look at profiling on Archer 2. Okay, hi again, everyone. I hope that was a, a good 15 minutes to get some tea or coffee or caffeine or just to stretch your legs for a minute um, before we get back to things. So, um, so that's us finished with debugging. I mean, um, with a two day course like this, we can't go into too much depth. Um, Something I would like to say before I move on to profiling is that if you feel that um, in-depth courses on, on debugging and profiling in particular on Arch2 would be of interest to you, please do let us know in the feedback. Um, I'm sure Julian mentioned um, the feedback to you on Friday, but you should receive emails um, within a few days or maybe a week or two um, asking for feedback on the course. So. Um, if there's anything at all you feel could be improved, please do let us know. Um, I just mentioned in particular, I do wonder if people would appreciate having some in-depth courses on debugging and profiling. Um, so please do let us know if that's something you would be interested in. Uh, but just for now, um, I guess moving on, um, we've now got uh, about well, 45 minutes as scheduled um, looking at profiling on Archer 2 and we'll be following a similar-ish kind of structure to the debugging session uh, where we'll talk a little about the profiling tools that are available um, and then really I'm just actually just going to really demonstrate to you um, how to profile a piece of example software, uh, a piece of an n-body particle uh, simulation software. Um, Okay, so again, links to documentation if you want to do further reading, um, but to move on to what's actually available on Archer 2, um, really falls, this really falls into, uh, again, um, two camps, the, the software provided by HP Cray and the third party software Almost all of the uh, the HP Cray software um, falls under this umbrella, uh, CrayPat. So that's the performance measurement and analysis tools, which has a few different components. Um, some of these almost work automatically, as we'll see, um, once you've got the, the modules loaded up. Um, so, CrayPat itself is the sort of um, full fat, if you like, piece of uh, a set of tools to help you in profiling software. It um, has three different components, really. Um, Pat Build, which is used to instrument an executable once you've already compiled it. Um, the runtime environment. Uh, so this is, is what actually runs um, during the profiling experiment, and you can influence it that, if you like um, with various um, various environment variables and such. And again, do some reading through the documentation, through the man pages to learn more. And finally, patch report, which is used to process the output from a given. Um, a given performance experiment. Um, CrayPack Lite is also provided by a different module. Uh, this is a simpler, easier to use version. It, it um, is a lot of the time, this is really all that you need. If you're just looking for a general overview, and we'll see 
um, creep at light will often give that to you. It's very easy to use. It doesn't require any um, any particular setup be before you run the experiment. It's just sort of compile and run, get some output. It's very simple to use. <clears throat> Reveal uh, lets you correlate performance data um, with the original source code, um, shows you maybe where you want to optimize further. It can say, show you, um, say, if there are any, uh, say, loops in your source code, which look like they might be um, you know, prime targets for optimization, maybe you want to unroll them or, or change the loop structure to a more, um, a more performance structure. Uh, Reveal can show that to you. The CrayPappy components uh, give you access to counters. And finally, um, Apprentice 2 uh, gives you a GUI to explore the uh, the output again. So this is sort of like patch report. Uh, Apprentice 2 sort of performs the same function as patch report, but gives you a GUI to do it. Um, I'll probably quickly show Apprentice 2 um, either in this session if we have time or probably otherwise this afternoon, maybe during the consultation session. Um, at the same time, other tools are available. Uh, Scalaska is available. Um, that uh, lets you instrument uh, an, an, an executable with uh, score P and then run it through Scalaska and then use uh, what's called the cube GUI to examine results. Um, that's a pretty powerful tool. We've occasionally run courses on using Scalaska. Um, I believe with the input or possibly even run directly by the Scalaska developers themselves. So um, you, may, you might be interested in looking into that. And we've also got ARM map. So ARM map um, comes alongside the, the DDT debugging tool. And again, this is available now, not available soon. This is available now for Archer 2 users, if you're interested. And if that's also discussed in the documentation. But for now, uh, we're going to use the sort of, again, the default tool, which is CrayPat, CrayPat Lite, and I'll also show how to use Apprentice 2 to profile an application. So I'll um, let me bring this over and clear that. So we've got some sample code to use, same as before. Um, it's a piece of parallel end body code. We aren't going to worry too much about what it's doing or uh, what the input we provide it means. We, we, do, we just want to build it and profile it. That's our goal here. So actually, um, let me just make a new directory. I'll just call it profiling. I'll grab that tar, gz. That's it, and I've got uh, a new directory, nbody dash par. Um, I'll do it on module unload gdb from HPC. Um, so now, if I module list, I just have everything here. Okay, um, so something you might notice, um, we've got here perf tool space. So this is actually a CrayPat component. So CrayPat actually includes, uh, uh, comprises rather several different modules. And depending on which modules you have loaded, it will work in different ways. So if I do module avail uh, perf tools, I actually see a few. Um, yes, so we've got perf tools light events, perf, perf tools light loops. There's even a perf tools light GPU, not that that's much use on Archer 2 at the moment, given there are no GPUs. But um, events will, uh, and uh, loops in particular, um, can be useful uh, light events. So this one, for example, will give more information on loops than just regular perf tools light. 
But for now, what we'll do is I'll do module load perf tools light. And if I now do module list, you'll see we've got both uh, perf tools base and perf tools light loaded. So perf tools base will always be loaded as part of the programming environment. Perf tools light lays on top of that and gives us access to the um, the simplified uh, the simplified in instrumentation method from Craypad Lite. So yeah, so when you log in, you should have PerfTools base loaded. You've just then got to choose to load PerfTools Lite. So I've already uh, done the extraction of the uh, nbody par archive and I've moved into that directory. If I do ls quickly, we'll see uh, what I have and it's just some source code files, some headers, there's a run.slurm here and there is a make file as well. <clears throat> so if I just run make, There'll be the usual output. It's just telling us, okay, it's building uh, the object files from the source files, and then finally it's linking them together into embodyparallel.exe. But what's actually happened is then, that because uh, because we've got Perf Tools Light uh, loaded, then that's going to automatically in instrument the executable at the end. Light samples. So this is going to give us a sampling experiment, um, and I can actually show you what this if I module module uh, unload. Kind of doing this in backwards order. Uh, if I module unload Perf Tools Light, then make clean, then make. You'll see it just builds it, just builds it, and links it, and that's it done. If I uh, load the Perf Tools Light module again, and then make clean, and make once more, and we get this extra output at the end. So this is just automatically creating uh, an executable ready for us to profile, just because we've got that module loaded. We haven't done anything else. We've just loaded the module. <clears throat> and as, as long as you're using CC or CC, capital CC, or um, or FTN to build, it will do that automatically. And you should, of course, be doing, be using the compiler wrappers anyway to build on any HP Craze system. Um, so we've created our instrumented executable. So if that runs, that's set up to run a performance experiment, um, a profiling experiment. Um, all we have to do is uh, submit it as a job, and we've got uh, a script here, which I do need to modify slightly. So TA081 is our account. Um, I'm just going to run that on the short QoS. If it's run just a little faster, hopefully. Uh, that's with a time limit of five minutes, which is fine. Uh, one node, 64 tasks per node. And then S1 is just going to execute the uh, executable with these options. Again, we're not going to worry too much about what those mean. Uh, we don't really care about what's in the code at the moment. It's just a demonstration of how the performance, uh, the performance um, test runs. So if I um, sbatch that should run, and I can sq uh, me to see how it's doing, and that's running perfect. Only going for two seconds. There's the node it's running on. Still running. Watch uh, sq me and it's finished it's completing and i imagine in a second that will be done and it's done okay 
So we've got our new output here, slurm dash out. So uh, let's just take a look at that, slurm out. text and I don't know why I, I noticed this before I don't know why um, I think it's possibly this version of claypad is outputting some binary near the top I don't understand why um, but we do still get at least um, the output if we switch to a newer uh, CPE version, I think that goes away. But um, uh, down, down below, it's got all the regular ASCII output. So um, so there's a little bit of claypat output just at the top so that you can straight away see um, that it is uh, an, an instrumented executable. The original executable was taken, it was modified. And there's the regular output from the simulation. So this is what you would normally see from this code. It's just outputting its regular, uh, its, its regular blurb to say what's happening during the run, uh, time step, number of time steps, number of MPI ranks, some information about uh, how long it took, some statistics about uh, how many interactions were taking place per second. So here's some performance information itself. Then we move on the actual uh, output generated by ClayPat itself. Gives us some, some statistics, so we've got some more information. Um, it tells us some handy bits when it started, what machine it ran on, a uh, number of uh, processing elements, so, so MPI tasks, essentially. Yeah, so PE stands for pro 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 processing elements, which is, uh, yeah, so in most cases, it means MPI, you know, the, the, the number of MPI tasks. Um, and then just some uh, general statistics, average process time, how much memory was needed, uh, again, per processing element, IO rate. And then we move on to the, um, oh, sure, question, sure, go ahead. I think someone's hand was raised just then. Sorry, I had my m microphone muted. Um, sure. <laughs> what does it mean by high memory? Uh, a couple uh, of lines so, above. So, so, so here it is. Um, how how much how much memory um was needed uh per per processing elements here? So high memory forty. Oops, oops it, I've gone past it. That. Uh, where was it? Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so this is saying um, how much how much memory in this case was taken across the entire run. So uh, just over four gigabytes, um, and then how much memory was needed per MPI task. So you can see this really wasn't very taxing. Okay, so the high memory is like the maximum amount used. Uh, yeah, across across the entire job, essentially, how much um, how much memory was given to the program um, across the entire job, and then how much memory, uh, what what was the high memory highest amount of memory needed per per API task, which yeah. was only sixty seven point four megabytes. Okay. Do you know if that's cumulative or instantaneous? Um, so like if you're allocating and deallocating through the job, whether it'll take the maximum amount that you used at any one time or the it's ma the maximum. So it's 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 the maximum amount at any one time um, as determined by the sampling rate. Um, because, I mean, as we'll see, this is a sampling ex ex experiment so it's sort of you know it, it pings the tasks every um every fraction of a second um and checks everything out and if it reaches a higher point between those you know those those pings it won't be registered so it's the highest amount you know so so there's some um 
there's some uh, cadence in how how, uh, how how often it actually looks at what 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 the memory usage is. But yeah, it's it's an it's an instant instantaneous amount, so that we can see you know across the duration of the run, uh, across the well across the duration of the S S run in particular within the job, what was the most that was needed at any given time. By the by, by that S one of the of the ex, of the ex executable. Okay, thanks. That's okay, useful. No problem. It is actually. I think. I think. I think even just things, even just things like this, are often pretty useful to know. Um, sometimes you do just need to know. You know how much how much memory does my job uh, use, and yet even little things like that can be. Can be handy to know um yeah i'm planning on doing some weak scaling so once you get down to the lower core counts actually it's really useful to know if it's going to fit sure, on yeah. more number of nodes or not yeah yeah absolutely absolutely okay um okay so yeah um so yeah so yeah there's just this sort of general uh general statistics up at the top and then um, and then it moves down into the more in-depth profiling. Um, so um, let me make sure I'm not going to be repeating myself here. Um, yes, yeah, so so we get a few sort of default prof, uh, 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 tables. So so this is what Craypad Lite does. It has a set of default um, default tables to produce so 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 default experiments to run during the execution of the program um, and if you want to do other things then you need to run one of the other uh, perf tools light modules or else load the full version of claypad and set things up um your your self to determine what you want to do um but here we've got so say for example here table one. There's a little bit of uh, of uh, information below. So it just tells you this table shows functions and line numbers with, within functions that have a significant exclusive sample hits averaged across ranks. So so what this is saying is um, uh, so here for example. What this is telling us, well, actually, let, let's let, let's let's start up at the top. This line here is telling us that 100% of the time was spent in the total group. So this this makes sense. 100% of the time was spent somewhere within the program. Then we've got these groups: user, MPI, and math. So we've then got time spent in each of these groups, 87% in user, 11.6% of the time spent in MPI, 1.4% of the time spent in math. So 87% of the time was spent in user, 87% of the time was spent in compute forces multiset. So we haven't looked at the code, but this is a function uh, within, uh, within the code uh, in one of these um, one of the C files here, parallel.c, I think it's in. Um, it's then telling us that 11.6% of time was doing MPI communications. And then it goes in further and tells us how much time was spent doing uh, in, in different MPI functions that were called. So 3.9%, 3.6%, 2.1% of time was spent doing MPI send receives, 1.8% of time was spent doing MPI receives. And then finally, it's telling us that 1.4% of time was just doing the square, square roots. So there's maybe immediately some, some information. If, 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 you, if you don't know how much time your, your, your code is spending on each of the tasks that it's got to do, you can just very quickly do this. You can just very, very quickly load uh, Craypad Lite, just build your code. It will be automatically in instrumented to do this, run it, and then check this output. It's just printed in the regular output from, from the run. 
straight to uh, standard out, you can take a look and get at least some idea of what's going on during your run. We can then break it down further. So if you then look at table two, um, what we've got is a similar looking uh, uh, table, but this is going a little further. It's telling us, um, let me move it over a little bit. It's telling us now um, how much time it's spending on individual lines within these, within these functions. So we, we saw before that 87% of the time of the code's execution was spent doing compute forces multiset. It's now telling us that uh, the biggest chunk of that was actually spent at line 148. And uh, a lot of time was spent in the, in the few lines following that. So if you thought that perhaps, you know, if, if, you, if you'd thought beforehand that this wouldn't have been such a big use of time, this would immediately be something that you would want to go and take a look at and see if you could optimize it all. Um, it also provides, so this is, this is quite nice, I think, it does provide some observations. Um, um, in particular, what you might see um, here, if, you're, if you try to run a large profiling job, um, sometimes uh, Craypat will be able to provide some observations here on a better distribution of the MPI tasks across nodes. Uh, I, I think this particularly occurs if for people who are running grid-based codes. What you might find here is an observation that um, if the communication is very structured, um, if, 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 yeah, if, the, if the communications are very structured because your grid code has um, a fairly rigid uh, communication structure itself, then you may get an observation here saying, you might want to lay out your tasks physically on the nodes in this way. And it will provide a file that you can then provide to the Cray mpitch. Um, in fact, you can provide a, a, an environment variable pointing to this file provided by the profiling one, which will then uh, physically lay out your MPI tasks according to what this observation here is saying. So it's saying, you know, if you want to maximize the communication, you know, if, if you want to have these tasks communicating faster because you see more communication between these tasks, you know, put them all on one node and it will provide a file that will automatically do that for you. It doesn't always help, um, but it very often does. Um, here we're not getting it because this one was all on one node. And as I say, it's, I think, particularly if it's um, grid codes where yeah, where there's a very um, obvious communication pattern um, based on the underlying um, arrangements of tasks, you know, of physical tasks across the, the grid. Um, more tables, so we also get um, some information about uh, the memory bandwidth across the, um, across the node here. So we can see there are the eight NUMA uh, regions across the one Archer 2 node, and we can see uh, how much time was needed um, to do that communication, how much memory, uh, how much communication that was sent across them, what, what the traffic was. Um, this might be useful, say, if you're, um, if you're coding um, an MPI, OpenMP hybrid code, and you're trying to work out um, what is the correct number of tasks and threads to use. And then finally, uh, there's some information about uh, power usage here. Oh, we've got a message. Ah, so, um, okay, failed to S-batch, got this one. Um, I think means you've probably been running uh, on the home file system. So if, if, you, if you try to submit a job from the home file system, it will fail because the home file, the home file system isn't mounted. So in your case, what, to, what, what directory to change to? 
so if you if you um if you get the source code and extract it in your work file system and that will just be um let me just copy and paste it into the chat that's probably easiest for you it's the same thing but you just use work rather than home at, at the beginning just like ah. that so so um so you can see if i quickly uh, exit here you can see that's where i am oh, yeah. so i'm in slash work slash ta081 slash ta081 and then wlta081 is just my my username so, yeah so if you just move to that move to that directory um copy the source code there build it there and submit them that issue should be solved all right yeah thanks yeah okay no, no, no problem um okay let's get that back again um, okay so where were we we were just looking through all this out as well as we um yes yeah, some information about power usage then um more about io so this is again this is a fairly broad sort of top level um set of outputs um it may be that this is you know this is a, this is just what you're looking for it may be that you want something else um and that's where we would turn to um, the full version of CrayPat. So uh, let me try and get a balance between these two windows. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I've got Perf Tools Lite loaded at the moment. I'm going to unload Perf Tools Lite. I'm going to load. Perf tools, if I can spell load, that is. Okay, so I've loaded Perf tools. So Perf tools is the full version of CrayPad. I'm going to make clean. Okay, and I'm going to make once more. So as I showed earlier, that just builds um, the executable. So if I were to run nbodyparallel.exe now, I wouldn't get any profiling information. It's just regular, uh, it's just the regular nbody parallel.exe it's just going to run the simulation and quit if you want to to instrument it so add on the extra bits the extra function calls the extra um extra uh, uh hooks to uh, get some profiling information from it we've got to run it through a second step which is pat build so if i run pat build on nbodyparallel.exe, that's going to instrument it. And if I ls now, we'll see um, here's nbodyparallel.exe, and here's our new one. So if I ls dash lt, there's nbodyparallel.exe plus pat. So this is our newly created. Uh, in, instrumented executable. So if we run this one, this will give us that extra output. Um, and the way that this works, and you should be able to do man uh, pat build, I think, will give us, yes. So this gives us all the extra information about what flags we can pass to pat build. Uh, and we're going to go through some of these um, these options just now. So one thing you can do is you can say, uh, for example, you can give it pat build dash g MPI will trace calls to MPI in particular. So if we if we wanted to do some really in depth profiling of what's going on in the calls to MPI, we could do this. And that would then, when we run it, give us that extra information. Without that, we're going to basically get what we did when we did uh, the Greypad Lite run. Um, what we do need to do, because we've got a different executable name, we've now got embodyparallel.exe plus pat, we need to uh, fix our job script. And 
ask it to run the new executable. So we just change the name to give it the uh, plus pat version. And then we can just s batch that and run it. That will give us some output in a minute. Uh, and I'll just watch that. So I'll watch sq me. We can see that that's running now. And when that finishes, um, we will get something. Uh, which I can show you. I think we'll finish in just a minute. Yes, there we go. Completing. And it's done. Okay. So if I run ls, now um, this is our new directory. So if I run ls l, in fact, uh, we bit. Yeah, so you can see that this is a new directory. It's just been created. And we'll call this an experiment directory. So this is a directory that contains a few more directories and files within those directories that contain the output from this particular run, this, this one particular run. And um, the format of that is the exe, so that's uh, nbodyparallel.exe plus pat. So that's just the name of the executable that we ran, the, the instrumented executable that we ran, plus, and then the process ID 203415, and then uh, and then the, uh, the, the ID of the rank zero node, 3425. And then finally, a single letter, which will be either S or T, which indicates the type of, of, uh, of, of experiment. And, and you'll actually see that uh, this directory exists from earlier. So this is actually the directory that was produced by our Craypat Light run. So the Craypat Light run produced just the same directory. So what we're about to do in a second, you can also do with the directories created by Craypat Light. Um, as I should, I'm just going to briefly mention, I think we will discuss it in a minute, what the sampling and tracing means here. So if we have an S or a T at the end here, um, I did also briefly mention this earlier. So if it's, if it's an S, if it means it's a sampling experiment, um, what it what 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 actually happens to do the profiling is that the executable will run, and 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 every so often the executable will be um, essentially stack traced, um, and so so every every fraction of a second it will see what is the stack of the of the of 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 each task or each thread. And as you keep on doing that repeatedly, you build up a, a statistical view of how much time was spent um, in, each, uh, in each function, in doing MPI, whatever. If you do a tracing experiment, on the other hand, um, you don't do this sort of this, this pinging of it every so often to find out what's What's, 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 what's happening. Instead, there are actual function calls inserted at the beginning and end of every function to say how much time, you know, it, it actually do, do directly measures how much time was spent in each function. Why you would want to do one or the other? Um, well, if you do a sampling test, then there's very little overhead there is o overhead, but it's not a massive amount of overhead. Um, so you are just every so often checking what's actually happening in the program and using that to build up, you know, out of the uh, you know, out of the 1000 times that we did a trace, we found that 50, you know, five, five, 500 of those were spent in this function. Therefore, we estimate that 50% of the time was spent in that function. 
what it might do is though is it might miss say small calls or short calls it might miss um um, um uh, anything of greater detail i guess um a tracing experiment on the other hand it measures directly how much time is spent in each function so you get much more accurate numbers um but at the same time there is an overhead from that and that overhead can can become much more sig significant so so your general tactic and we'll kind of do this here in a way uh, we'll show a way of doing it that's automated by Craypad is to start with a sampling experiment to work out overall where time is being spent and then to hone in on that to do a tracing experiment so that you're only tracing the parts that you care about so you're you're um, impacting the overall performance with a much smaller overhead while getting much more accurate numbers on the parts that you do care about. So to carry on from that little aside, um, we've created uh, we've we've created our instrumented executable nbodyparallel.exe plus pat. We've run that. And that's generated a directory containing the results um, of that particular run of the performance data ga gathered, gathered during that run. What we can do is we can then uh, get the results of that in readable form by doing patch reports and then giving the name of that directory. If you just run it like that, it's going to just dump a whole load to screen. So let's, uh, you know, you can, um, put, you can pipe it to less or you can redirect it to file. And this is the output that you get. And it's actually pretty similar to what we saw previously from the Craypat light output. Um, so this is just going to give us some more information. Uh, depending on what we ask for, we will get different things. So we're getting more information there about the NUMA uh, regions, memory bandwidth. Loads of uh, output at the end. Um, but what we can do, there is sort of a lot of information there, and it's not necessarily what you want. You can change the arguments. You can you can you can pass options to pat report to then uh, get different information. So I'm just going to copy this here, and what we're now asking for is we're asking for um, only to get a profile report by function. So I'll uh, do the same for the next three again. I'll pipe it to less. Get some similar outputs at the top. And as we go down, get some more information. And then it finally gives us the table. I guess uh, this was a previous one, so things have gone a little differently here. Um, and you can again change things. Um, I won't do all of these. Um, you can again, again, you can you can man pat report um, and see. Um, so it's this dash o is what you want to look at you can there is dash o um see the keywords so uh so whatever you want to look at you can you can give these as options to pat report and then the output will show that to you so if you want to see the line numbers and callers show the line numbers and call tree you want to uh, look at the heap memory, load balance, loop times, this might be interesting, um, loop call tree, whatever, whatever you want to look at. Um, 
and you can and you can combine them by uh, with a plus sign in the middle um, and then you get extra information um, something you might want to do um, this is uh, helpful um, what do you see are averages over all tasks? So the information given to you in those tables are averaged over all your PEs. Again, your, your PEs are your MPI tasks. Um, but maybe you don't want to see averages over all of them. Um, you can do this by filtering uh, which uh, PEs you want to average over. So you could do a patch report and then you give it this extra option, dash S filter input, and you'd say for PEs less than 10. And that would give you uh, averages again, but only over uh, PEs zero to nine. On the other hand, if you just wanted to look at the, um, at the output for one particular task, um, perhaps you expect that one task in particular is slowing things down, you can ask for PE equals equals zero, say, if you just wanted to look at task zero or whatever, whatever, uh, uh, whatever other task number. And then you would uh, just see information for that one particular task. Um, and um, like I say, um, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um is it also possible to see, say, the maximum or the minimum time spent as well as the average? Um, I'm kind of thinking about load balancing uh, and checking whether you're you know, closer to like a an all await one or a one await all um, kind of situation. Each, each uh, Pat, um, our map definitely does this. It gives you a distribution. I don't know about Craig. Yeah, map does. Um, to be honest, at this point, I'm a bit more used to using map than I am Claypad. I'm sure it must be. Um, That's just um, Patch rather than Claypad. So map, map. Oh, so, map. so 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 arm arm map. Um, so you can find so so part of so part of what you would find so yeah so. So something which it does show, I'm, I'm sure it must show the minimum flexible. Um, but what what you can get are the imbalances. Um, do I have? What do I have here? Maybe I should just show the. Um, ah no, it might be in that because we've overwritten it. Um, so what so what you do get are the imbalances. So the imbalances show you the uh the deviation from the mean so the one which was worse how how far away is it from the average so okay. if you so if you if you so if you can see um um something with a high imbalance that means that the 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 task which was slowest there which spent most time there how far away was it from the average so what you ideally want is everything to be very low because then uh, that means that all of your tasks are spending similar lengths of time in that function here where we've got you know 98.4 um, percent spent in mpiw time and i think that's probably a fluke what that we're seeing here um that's that's very high <laughs> Yeah, um, unless one of them is particularly in MPIW yeah. time. Yes. Um, I think um, let's look. Let's let's look on the left here, uh, for example. So here we're looking at um, time spent in different lines, say, of a uh, compute forces multiset, um, or, or 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 here, say, perhaps the MPI is better. Um, here, what we're seeing is that there's an imbalance percentage of 52.9% on MPI file right all. That means that one of the tasks, at least, was 52.9% uh, spent uh, longer in that than the average. One of them spent 81% longer doing an, an MPI send receive than the average. So these are not balanced. 
yeah. something uh, something is spending much longer than than the others in just doing an MPI send send receive. I'm sure that there must be a way to get just the maxes uh, rather than the averages. Um, I mean, you can work it out from the average and the the imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. got the... the imbalance is is a way to at least see it quickly. I, I do think it would be nice to see just what those values are, just just to actually get values for the min and the max would be helpful as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure it must be possible, but it's off the top of my head. Um, heads, I'm not sure. Um, you can at least find the PEs with with those through uh, through load balance. I think this isn't this looks like an option to O. Oh, so you so you can find those times. Well you, you can find the PEs with those times. Um, yeah, or I guess it gives you a definition of the of the imbalance. Um, okay, yeah, so it's yeah going above the average. And I guess if you see that one of them is one function is fairly imbalanced, you could just kind of dump manually dump the time yeah. for every process uh, and plot it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, no, no problem. Um, again, um, I mean, MAP has been mentioned here, and I do think, um, again, MAP, I, I'm trying to encourage people to use MAP um, and DDT because I do think that they are very, very nice tools. So um, so if you want to go into that level of detail and have a, have a, um, a GUI to examine vis visually um, the performance, um, I think MAP does a good uh, is, does a good job of splitting down where time is being spent in different uh, different functions and different groups of functions, and I definitely recommend taking a look at that as well. Um, okay, uh, carrying on then. Uh, where were we? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we were looking at filtering. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so um, so I did quickly mention. Um, Yes, so a clay pat light one will, will also produce an experiment directory, experiment output, and you can use pat run, uh, sorry, pat, pat report on that directory, just, just the same way to get um, output. Again, if you want to check out different things or filter the output or whatever you like. Um, so, Yes, so, so so everything we've done so far has been um, has been a sampling experiment. Um, I said that what you really want to do is sort of start with a sampling experiment, and then maybe if you want to um, home in on things, you can then run a tracing experiment to get more accurate information, but only for some subsection of functions that you feel are worth looking into in that detail. What you can do is you can um, you can automate this uh, through um, GreenPad using what's called uh, APA, which is the Automatic Program Analysis. Um, so I quickly uh, show you. Um, yes, uh, so inside our first sampling experiment, there uh, is uh, indexed of AP2, AP2 files, XF files, um, and actually it's probably in XF files, is it? So, well, I didn't mean to do that. He <laughs> went back. Um, is we well actually it's provided at the end of path report as well. Um, I have path report and go to the end. Um, probably gives it up here.
it should provide it provides somewhere in the output um, the options needed to give to Pat's build to um, to set up uh, to to set up um, an, a, 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 a traced experiment um, and the functions and groups of functions to be traced are determined by what were found to take a lot of time in the initial sampling run. So, um, sure. Ah, okay, option file APA contained. So yes, yeah, so 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 if you were to run um, an APA uh, run. You would, it would, you would, you would first of all do a sampling test. So, so just an, a normal sampling ex experiment, perhaps with no options at all. That would then produce this output, and these are the are, are what Craypad thinks are the the optimal um, options for a traced experiment. So it's saying, do things like um, check MPI in particular. Uh, syscall IO. So you would then do, um, uh, you would then do pat build dash o n body uh, power exe plus pat plus something else, and then It's not there. Why is it not there? It's inside here, perhaps. No, it's not. Hmm. Why did it not generate the APA file? I wonder if, if the um, pad has been changed because I don't remember it producing that uh, that binary output at the beginning either initially. Um, let me try let's just run dot slam again. Feeling it's going to do it differently. May have changed. Uh, um, Ah, that's why. Yeah, I think I think the run was possibly. Let's just try Pat's report. I'm taking a bit too long on this section again. Uh, let's just take a quick look. Yes. I think it's part of the issue of um, running such a small program. Um, again, is when you're sampling the uh, so you can put my dog barking there. Um, <clears throat> when you're when you're running such a short program and you're sampling, you're running a sampling experiment. It doesn't actually have enough time uh, sometimes to 
properly sample what's happening. Um, so if you're running something external, it does pick up the user, uh, the user uh, functions and it. it will generate an APA file. That, 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 that APA file, so that's just going to be called buildoptions.apa and that will live in your experiments directory. <clears throat> and you can pat build dash o and then give it the path to that .apa file. That will then build your uh, your .exe again uh, in, and in, instrumenting it against your uh, you, you, using the options from the APA file. Um, and that's now a tracing ex 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 experiment. And it's going to specifically trace the functions or groups of functions. So some of your user functions, perhaps, or perhaps everything in MPI to find out much more ac ac accurately how long uh, those functions are taking, how much time is being spent within them. You can then run that again. You can just um, change your Slurm script to run that. And, um, and when you get the output, it will be a little different. So before, for a sampling experiment, you'll see this sample percentage and samples, and you'll get this information, this information. When you do, um, a tracing experiment, you'll see that changes to time and time. So now it's actually telling you how much time was spent in, um, you know, in function name, how much time was actually spent doing MPI receives. Um, and there's a new group here, uh, MPI sync. So there's MPI, and now there's MPI sync as well. That tells you how much time was spent waiting in collective calls. Uh, and you only get that from tracing runs. So it can be worthwhile um, moving on from, from sampling experiments to, to tracing experiments uh, to get that extra information. Um, you can also get information from the hardware counters this way. If you want to see things, um, um, you know, what were your L2 prefetches like? What's what your cache miss is like? Um, this is probably um, um, my feeling is that this is useful if you're doing things like OpenMP, if you're working threaded um, uh, in threaded code. Um, I'm sure, you know how how tricky um, it can be to get uh, OpenMP codes to actually run faster when you're dealing uh, with the cache or anything else which might be useful for you. Um, <clears throat> uh, finally, um, I mean, we are running a little behind here, but I do think it's worthwhile showing this. Um, so let me see if I can do so quickly. Um, let me let me um, quickly try to I'll do this in a different terminal. Um, so if you log into Archer 2 uh, and you log in with um, with X11 forwarding enabled, um, so you can use a dash X or dash Y. Um, let me um, move this over. Oops, this. Uh, I've lost my terminal. Where is it? Here it is. So here I am. I've just logged in again here. Um, I need to move to my uh, work directory and into um, profiling. So I've just logged in. Um, you only need to have perf tool space loaded for this to my directory. So I logged in uh, with the dash, dash x um, option to enable 
x11 forwarding. So here I am again, I've got all of these here and I should be able to just do app2 and then give it the name of an experiment. And here we go, Apprentice 2 is loading. Okay, so here we go. So again, I feel like uh, something has gone a little uh, off piece here with terms of um, the fact that it's not actually profiling time in user in the user space. Um, but uh, you can now do things like uh, that's not right either. Of course, I'm missing the user um, data, but you can. Um, you know, now start doing things like um, you can produce flame uh, plots. You can uh, look at the time needed for communication between uh, different tasks. Again, PE here, processing elements. And you can look at um, call trees um, and how much time was spent in different functions. So if you prefer to have a more graphical uh, look at what's happening in your program. Um, yep, you can just start up app to apprentice to in this way and have a look around. Okay, uh, so um, with that, we can move on. So yes, the main profiling tool, so yeah, the, 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 the default profiling tool in Arch2 is Graypad. That will always be there. Um, but if you really do want to spend a lot of time looking, um, a lot of time doing profiling, you, it has been mentioned, you may want to look into using um, ARM map as well. Um, so we've got another section here on how to be a good Arch2 citizen before lunch. I don't think this will actually take too long, so I'll try and get through this and then we can head off to get something to eat uh, before coming back again for the afternoon. So this is really about how to, how to, um, how to, I guess, take care of yourself and other people on Archer 2. Um, some of it may not be entire, you know, it, it may not be intuitively obvious, it may not um, be the first thing you think of, but uh, I think this is all fairly important stuff as well. Um, it's a little less technical, certainly. Um, so um, the first thing is what, what really should we be doing on the login nodes or uh, indeed not doing on the login nodes? Um, move that out of the way. Um, so we've got on Archer 2 in total about 4,000 users. Um, obviously, they aren't all going to be logged on at the same time doing things, but it's reasonable to assume a good percentage of them will be. And they'll all be on the login nodes doing things, you know, managing data, um, building code, editing code. Um, working in Git repos, whatever they need to do. Um, so it's important for everyone, um, and, and this is sort of something that we just ask generally everyone to to please not overload the login nodes doing heavy duty work. So kind of a sort of general um, so we've got some, some 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 general bits of advice here on these two columns. Um, so we ask people to not launch parallel tasks on the login nodes. Do Cray and Pitch, you can't do that anyway. Um, I believe you can with OpenMPI, but but you shouldn't be is the thing. So we, we ask people to not run parallel tasks on the login nodes. At that point, you'll be using extra resources, extra compute power to do that. Um, and anyone who is doing that would be essentially making things slower and a bit more difficult for everyone else. In the same vein, people should not really be running uh, CPU heavy tasks on the login nodes. Um, 
you say you, you can do quick tests, so something that uses only a few minutes, you know, just to make sure that something actually starts, that something will actually read in the input correctly, perhaps something like that. But, but it should be in serial only, and it should be over very quickly. If you do anything more than that, then, then it, it will affect other people. Um, so really, yeah, the, 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 the gist of the whole thing here is that login nodes are a shared resource. They're therefore potentially hundreds of people to use at any one time. And so we would ask that any user does not slow things down. Um, potentially, you know, I, I understand that people can do this unintentionally, but to please remember that everyone should not be making things difficult for other people. Um, if, if you do accidentally um, get something running and you can't stop it, um, the first thing to do is to use PS UX to list all your processes on a given login node. So if you know it's running, say on LN01, you need to go onto LN01 to do this. And you can just SSH across from another login node to LN01 if necessary. Then use PSUX, that will list all your processes that are running there. And you can then use kill to kill those, uh, to kill the necessary process. Sometimes I have um, seen people who genuinely, you know, sometimes tasks do just go out of control and you actually can't kill it. In that case, just email the service desk and we can uh, let the systems team know and they can kill that task for you because they have root access and can do that. Um, kind of similarly, um, sometimes people notice um, other people, you know, doing this. Sometimes you will be logged on and you might run top, say, and see, oh, user whatever is, you know, using a lot of memory and a lot of processing power. Um, we would again ask people to please not, you know, um, to not deal with that themselves. Um, if you if you spot anything like that and you suspect that someone's using unfair uh, an unfair amounts of the login node resource. Again, um, please just email the service desk and we can deal with things um, ourselves. Um, just because, you know, I'm sure you can imagine things can get a little tricky sometimes if users are sort of um, uh, uh, trying to uh, deal with these issues themselves. So, um, got a brief exercise here. We'll only take a couple of minutes on it, so literally two minutes. Um, just to look through these five commands and see, you know, which ones do you think would probably be okay to run on the login nodes and which ones would not be okay to run on the login nodes. So, you know, just take a couple of minutes for this. This should be very quick. So I'll talk to you again in, yeah, two minutes time. We can see about this. Okay, hi again. Um, hopefully this doesn't take any too long. Um, why don't you say, um, if you've got some thoughts here, why don't you just list in the chat the commands which you think would probably be okay to run? You can just type in the numbers, you know, one, two, three, not four or five. Okay, so two, three, five has been given by one person. Anyone else have any thoughts which ones would be okay to run? Three and five, okay. Assuming that the script in three does what it looks like. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It could be called create directories and it might do something completely different. Two, three, five, two, three, five. Okay, okay. So three and five, um, everyone agrees on. Two, mainly people think would be okay. Let's take a look at the solution. Um, Again, you've 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 basically all got this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and um, including the slight question mark about uh, about two. So Python physics sim dot pi. That you know, it's Python. It it may or not be may or may may or may not be parallel. Um, 
but it sounds like it's going to take a while. It's probably going to be fairly long running. So yeah, that's probably not okay to run on the login modes. Make, um, make should be fine. Um, often makes don't take too long. You can just quickly run that. Make, um, on the other hand, you know, if you're building code, sometimes it can take a long time. I think, um, is it is it quantum espresso in particular or something I've built? It takes forever. Um, so if you're building something that really does take a long time, or compilers, say perhaps you want to build a compiler that's entirely possible, um, then um, then you may want to instead actually just run it on the compute node. Um, then you've got the whole node to yourself for however long. Um, you don't have to um, you you. You don't have to stay logged in. You can just run it as a job. So sometimes um, running builds on a compute node is actually just a wee bit simpler. Um, but in general, building code on the compute no on, on the login node, sorry, is perfectly fine. Create directories. Sh yes, as was mentioned, if if it is actually just creating directories, that's perfectly fine. Um, managing data is sort of one of the main uh, one of the main uses for the login nodes. If um, if it is actually running a simulation and it's just called something else completely different, then that's not okay. Molecular Dynamics 2, again, sounds like it's some kind of simulation that's probably going to be running for quite a while. Probably not okay to run, no. Um, finally, uh, this is going to extract an archive, the final uh, one number five, this tar command. Um, it's probably okay um, if it's something really big, though. Uh, you know, gigabytes, maybe you know, you know, maybe even terabytes. Perhaps um, it might be simpler to just run, run it as a job. Um, perhaps on the data analysis node, um, that's free to do. It's got access to both the home and work file systems. Um, you can start it and let it run, you know, an hour or two, maybe however long it needs to extract a massive pile of data. Okay, that's the sweep. I think everyone got that perfectly. Um, and um, yeah, other things, I mean, some of these are fairly obvious. Do not share your login credentials. Um, that's something we're fairly strict on because there have been issues, um, um, have been sick. So security issues um, in the past. So um, if we find, say, for example, I think I think a big thing that sometimes happens is things like um, um, staff will share accounts with, say, PhD students, um, which you know I, I, I understand it's completely benign in intent, but it does unfortunately um, make 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 a risk. So we will always ask people to please don't share your details with anyone else. Um, if the systems team think that they've detected that, we'll ask for, you know, we will reset passwords, ask everything to be reset, get in touch with you. Um, so yeah, please don't do that. Um, just, just because it does introduce a risk to the system. Um, and you know, and there are the shared directories about for sharing code, for sharing data, um, and you can even run jobs from them if you want, um, the, the shared directories on the work file system. Um, really for your benefit, this is a big thing to test before before scaling. Um, if, you, if you think you're going to be running something big, um, please make sure that um, it runs properly first. Um, so like the examples here, imagine a job script with a mistake that makes it sit doing nothing for 24 hours on 1000 cores. That's, uh, that's going to be a lot of CUs wasted. Or maybe, um, maybe you write a job script that asks for 2000 cores, but you actually only run on 100 of them. That's, that's really bad for you and other people. Um, you will end up wasting a lot of CCCUs, CUs which you could be using to run, you know, actual meaningful work, but you've accidentally lost it. It's bad for other people because those are, are 
know, it's sitting there doing nothing useful when it could be used for other things. Um, <clears throat> also, um, if the system is busy at any time, you know, imagine the, um, um, you know, these, these examples above, you, you might um, spend a long time waiting for your job to start. And then because of some mistake in them, you know, after you've spent, you know, 12 hours waiting for them to start, they do start and then there's a typo and they crash out immediately. They read, uh, you know, they try to start from a, a, a non-existent non, non input file, say, for example. So you spend 12 hours waiting, it starts, it tries to read, um, you know, x5.in, oh, it was actually x4.in and x5.in doesn't exist. Um, that's really annoying. So always um, setting up your job with, you know, small, small, short, small, uh, small resource requirements to run for not very long, just to make sure that everything works before you get going, um, can save you a lot of time and resources potentially. Um, having a backup plan, so we're talking about data now, it is very useful because inevitably something will go wrong. It happens to everyone at some point. They, they RM when they're in the wrong directory or something like this. Um, having, having a plan for what to do in case will always at some point be helpful. On the home file systems, uh, there are snap, snap, snapshots are made um, every so often. Um, I can show you this quickly. If I um, let's clean this up a little, if I cd back to um, uh, the uh, home directory, and I can then get the absolute link. So I'm in home three. If I go into slash home three. Uh, slash dot snapshot, I can see all the snapshots that have been taken. So, so anything uh, that I have, and I don't actually have anything in my home directory on this account, uh, but it will have been backed up here. So, um, 12.05 was what, just, just under an hour ago, I can see the into here. CD into here, and, um, and it's the exact same. But again, TA081, TA081, and what's my username? WLTA081. So there's my uh, snap, snapshot of my home directory from just about an hour ago. Um, it's just that it's actually empty because I don't have anything in my home directory. But if there were something in here, it would have been snapshotted, stored there. So you can always get to your home directory snapshots if need be. Um, the work file systems are where you'll actually be running from, but remember these are high performance luster file systems. Uh, they aren't actually backed up. They're too large um, to these, these two, reasonably do. Um, so really what you should be doing is you should be storing the small amounts of really critical data, things like code, say for example, in your home file system, but then actually building it and running it on the work file system. And as soon as you generate that really important data, copy it away to um, you know your local storage, your local backed up storage, hopefully. I mentioned things like source code. Um, using the version control system, such as Git, is always a good idea here. If you can back it up to a cloud-based storage, so GitHub or, or uh, GitHub or GitLab, um, or um, possibly also um, storing it on local repositories, that's 
a great way of making sure you don't ever lose it. You can also store larger files in there as well, small input files. If you do have large amounts of data, you can do that. Large file storage there as well. For actually storing your large data, things like rsync. Rsync in particular, so you, you, you can just SCP data, but rsync um, has the extra options for, uh, for archiving, which are very useful. Generally, um, this next point, generally people's access to Archer will be time limited. You'll be on a specific project which is due to run from one date to another date. Um, and generally, some kind of data management plan will have been given as part of the technical assessment beforehand. Uh, so there'll be some kind of plan for storing data. But you do need to make sure that before that access finishes, you've got your data and you've moved it away to somewhere that, that you have long term access to. Um, if you do have large amounts of data, again, yeah, please don't underestimate how long it might take to move that, particularly if your storage um, is outside the UK or, or, or if it's in the UK but not on the academic network, Janet, then um, bandwidths will be lower and moving that data might take really quite a long time. So um, so, so really, um, I mean, moving, moving data away as soon as possible, um, while you know, keeping organized, um, minimizes the chance of you, you know, accidentally losing it for whatever reason, or and, and minimizes um, the chance that you essentially run out of time to transfer it. And yeah, really, the main point here is that everyone's data is assumed to be their own their own responsibility. <clears throat> um, and I think some of this was covered probably on Friday. Um, um, so some considerations um, while transferring large volumes of data are, well, really these four points here. So disk speed, so the R2 work file system is very high performance. Um, if you have a fantastic network in the middle, but you're copying to a slow hard disk, then your data transfer speed might be limited by how quickly that, uh, that disk can write. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. You may want to say copy to an SSD or something instead. Um, metadata operations limit things. If you're opening and closing lots and lots of very small files, so again, an open phone comes to mind here that produces loads and loads of very small files rather than a few big ones. Um, then each of those file has its files has its own met metadata, and that has to be dealt with. That 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 introduces quite a large overhead. Um, so um, so combining these files into single large archives um, can often make working with that data easier. Um, network speed um, is kind of the obvious thing here, I guess. Um, if you have a slow network speed, then of course the data transfer um, performance will be reduced because of that. Um, so that's why often, you know, if you have access to some kind of, uh, some kind of institutional uh, data storage facility, um, preferably on the academic network, which will probably be faster than what you can get at home. That's probably your best bet for at least an initial data transfer des destination. Um, finally, um, there's a firewall. Firewalls will be everywhere. Um, and uh, sometimes that can limit things. There's not much really that you can probably do about that yourself unless you are moving to a personal machine. So you may need to check up on what's being done institutionally there if you suspect that that is introducing some limit. Um, so yeah, so really some sort of general um, some some general pointers on how to make this as efficient as possible. First of all, 
know what you're transferring. Maybe don't transfer everything if you don't actually need everything. Only transfer the things that you need, the things that you do actually need to transfer. It's best to put them in some kind of archive, first of all, to massively potentially potentially yeah potentially massively cut down on the metadata operations required um also um transferring a few large files is faster just because there's few there's less overhead from the communication and again um, fewer metadata operations required when transferring a few large files so if you can put them in a single tar or a single zip first that's always good and to then transfer them over the fastest network possible to the uh, device with the highest light speeds possible, whatever that may be. Probably you know, some kind of RAID system or another luster system somewhere, SSD system. So yeah, so these are things which you've maybe possibly thought about in the back of your head, but not maybe at the front of your head before, um, but hopefully just some general points to to keep things moving smoothly while working on Archer 2 or probably any other similar system that you might have access to. Um, both, you know, keeping things smoothly for you and for everyone else. And if, if they're doing the same, then that's also working to keep things moving smoothly for you. Um, so with that, yeah, so just some key points. Um, it's kind of, um, really bashing it in here a bit, isn't it? Uh, be, be, be careful how you use the login node. Your data is your responsibility. Don't run stuff on the login node. Don't be a bad person run stuff on the login node. Um, hopefully that is uh, making that particular point a little too clear perhaps, but it is an important one. Um, so with that, um, that will break for lunch. So it's, 10 past one at the moment. Uh, is transferring, so we've got a question, is transferring files to Arch2 through SFTP straightforward? Uh, yes, yes it is. So if you use say um, Win, WinSCP or FileZilla or something, say, um, yeah, I found it pretty pretty straight straightforward to do so. If you, if you do use um, in particular those, those you know, uh, GUI clients on Windows, it does just require a few steps to set up use of the of the SSH key, but um, I've helped people do that in the past, and it's pretty straightforward. And once it's set up, I would say yeah, it's a very smooth way of moving data back and forth. Um, okay, great. Um, so yes, yeah, so we can stop there for lunch. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat just in case anyone does have any questions over lunch. Um, otherwise, we'll come back at say uh, 10 past 10 past two to carry on for this afternoon session and um, if we just have a look at what we're doing this afternoon um, so we've got a couple of um, fairly shortish sections on uh, using the safe and uh, next steps for using Archer 2 then we've got a break and then we've got this final consultancy session um, to finish off the day until we get to four o'clock. Um, so in this session, um, I would start to think about it if you haven't had a look at this already. Um, have a think about um, if, if there's anything you want to do on Archer 2. So this can be anything through from the kind of question we've had just now about um, you know, how to use SFTP to move data to and from Archer 2. So maybe, you know, if you're trying to build something on Archer 2 and having problems, if you want to think about profiling or debugging um, and want to have a go this afternoon while we're here to help, James and I will be here to answer questions. Any of these um, topics that you maybe want to ask questions about or try while we're here to help, you can you can do that in this afternoon's session. Um, so yeah, so anything to do with what you want to do on Arch2, we will be here to, uh, to, to talk about it if you want. Um, 
Otherwise, um, there's another task if you want to. Um, so Gromax is a uh, biomolecular modeling software um, that's available centrally on Arch2. You can just use it by loading a module. Um, we provide an input file for it. And what you can do is you can write a job script for Gromax and then start running jobs on Arch2 on your TA081 accounts. And you know, you can, if you want, just try to uh, work out what is a good setup um, for running this job. Um, how, 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 how many nodes, how many threads? Do you want to use symmetric multi-threading? Um, I could spoil that, but um, maybe you want to check out, check that out yourself. Um, so this is just maybe, you know, if you just want to have some, have a go at running jobs on Arch2, that's something else you can do. Or perhaps at that point you feel you've had enough and you want to head off for the day, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to say, yeah, just maybe start to think about what you want to do for this afternoon's session. Uh, yeah, for this final session, the boot bootstrapping consultancy session. But aside from that, um, yeah, we'll come back, we'll start again at, um, what, what did I say, 10 past two to uh, move on to the final couple of sessions this afternoon. So I hope you enjoy your lunches and talk to you in a bit under an hour.